education for African Americans is seen and has historically been seen as a path to freedom. It is the basic fundamental right and continues to be for many African American families. We would be, uh, you know, treated in, in a way that if you fail, it was a much bigger deal. You know, like we always, we knew growing up, uh, a lot of black people would say this, you know, we were always told by the elders, you have to be better. You know, you have to be better than them, you know, if you want to make any progress and get ahead. Education is something no one can take away from you. And for that reason, education has this really important position for African American lives. You can take away my basic rights as a citizen. You can use violence to keep me in my place. You can make it so I can't buy a house or I can't go to certain spaces. But you can't take away the education once I have it. When I went to high school, um, we didn't socialize. You know, I remember uh, in the morning we'd get to school and all the black kids would be, we'd be in one area in the hallway. That was like our little area right there. And uh, we would hang out there, but we didn't socialize, we didn't eat lunch together. Uh, we did sports together, you know, but other than that. I remember one event where when we would uh, do a sport, you'd be picking teams. And this one teacher, well, he said this here, he said, uh, when we picked our teams, he looked over and he says, uh, he said, wow, he said, yeah, you, you niggers and, be and beaters really stick together. Because, of course, we pick each other, you know, because we had that kind of relationship. Of course. <laughs> well, <clears throat> there were like click groups in the schools, you know, uh, and they wouldn't allow certain nationalities to participate in some of their social clubs. I went to Wilson Elementary School, um, and um, I remember in the fourth grade when they got to the part in the history about slavery, you know. And um, I remember when they got to talking about slavery, that all the kids would turn around and look at me like, oh, you know, kind of thing. It was, it was embarrassing, you know, and humiliating to say the least. And of course, they just, they didn't really go deep into it, you know, into the history at all. There was only two black kids in the elementary school, me and one of my neighbors. And so uh, we would go to school almost every day. The way I remember it, it seemed like it was almost every day. On our way to school, you know, uh, these little white boys would hide in the bushes, and when we would come near, they'd start throwing rocks at us, you know, and just be like, nigger, 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 and throwing rocks and laughing and running. And so that would happen at, at lunchtime, that would happen at recesses, and the teachers would be standing right there. So I went home and, and told my mom, I said, Mom, I said, this is what's going on. She said, why don't you tell the teacher? And I'm like, teacher standing right there, you know, and she said, well, you should tell her anyway. I said, they're not going to do anything. So I was in the fourth grade at the time, so I, I, so the next day I go to school and I tell the teacher, and she says, uh, she says, okay, take, she's going to take me to see the principal. His name was Mr. Emily. And so we get in his office. Remember, I go in the office, I'm by myself, and he tells her to close the door. And he, he looked at me and he said, he said, uh, he said, what's your problem? And I said, well, these kids are throwing rocks at us every day and calling us niggers. And he said, uh, he said, why is that a problem? He said, you are a nigger. And then he proceeded to say, let me tell you something, boy. He says, you'll never be as good as us. You're inferior. And he just laid that out. And then he took me and he got me by my arm, walked me across the playground, sat me down on this bench and said, uh, uh, he said, this is your area. He said, you're not allowed on this part of the school. He said, don't ever cross this again. Well, probably within... 15 minutes, my friend, only other black kid there, falls and hurts himself. So he's got to go to the nurse's office, which me and I had to go in that area. So I'm going to go with him because we're going to stick together. So when I went in there, uh, the nurse gave me a really funny look and she kind of gets on the phone. And the next thing I know, Emily shows up, Mr. Emily shows up. And he grabbed me behind my neck and picked me up off of my feet and carried me across the playground. And he slammed me on the bench and he, he said, listen, you little nigger. He said, I told you, you're not allowed over here. He says, and that's it. So I went home, I told my mom, and my dad heard about it. My dad says, he said, I know Emily. He said, I work at the post office with him during the summer. He said, he's, no, he said, he's a car carrying KKK. 
And so my dad took me to school the next day. And uh, we went in the office and my dad said, you wait right here. And my dad just busted in his office. And I remember hearing like things, commotion and everything. And then my, when my dad came out, he turned around, he said, you ever put your hand on my son again? He said, I'll kill you, you know? And then we didn't see Mr. Emily at school for like about four or five days. And uh, when we did see him, he was wearing dark sunglasses, so. One of the differences was that if, if we did anything that would be considered, you know, breaking the rules, we were treated much harsher. You know, the standards were much harsher. And so, you know, I never did anything really bad, you know, in, in school. But any little thing you did, uh, they just bring the hammer down on you. So I got, I was, I got disqualified from sports for sophomore year and uh, never played again, you know, for, for the next two years of my life. to not only educate, but in some, ta in some cases, um, activate and uh, aggravate students to thinking that they would not be um, come familiar with if they weren't on college campuses. The college campus or the university campus, particularly again in the post-World War II period, because of the GI Bill, you also see the population of those who have access to education post-secondary education for the first time expand, not just for whites, but also for blacks. And because of that, more people are going to college, which meant that more people are coming in contact with one another. They're having more, more conversations. These college cases, uh, campuses, even when they were very strict, and they were, uh, didn't matter what college ca campus you were on, uh, the 1950s and early 1960s college campuses were very strict spaces. But as students started to push back against the control that colleges and universities had over them, that naturally filtered into other areas. So they became places of uh, where students could congregate, they could think, they could learn. Um, and that learning sometimes meant starting to become activists in nature. Um, so we cannot uh, dismiss at all of the importance of college campuses and college students, university and college students, to the larger civil rights movement. It is that youth of the civil rights movement that came from those spaces that could explode the civil rights movement in the latter part of the 1950s into the early 1960s. Education was seen as this pathway to everything else. With education, you could get a job. You could get yourself, if not a job, into better financial or economic um, situations. You could start your own business. You can become politically active. When you know your, your rights, you know the laws and the books, how do you challenge those? Only when you educate yourself to those. But if you can't educate yourself because you don't have basic things, like you've never been allowed to read, so education for African Americans still to this day is seen as a pathway to something better.